for one year in 1816 across the entire world, the seasons didn't change. In the West, 1816 is now known as the year without a summer. A dry fog filled the sky, which reddened and dimmed the sunlight, so much so that irregularities on the surface of the sun, sunspots, were visible to anyone looking up at the sky. By May, the winter frost that had not receded had killed off most of the crops in areas with higher elevations like New Hampshire and Vermont, as well as upstate New York. In many places on May 26, the dark fog that covered the world completely eclipsed the sun. In June, snow was still falling in New York, Maine, and New Jersey. The moldy and unripened crops that survived were not even fit to be fed to the pigs. In June, one night, the darkness wiped out the moon and the stars completely. In Canada, provinces ran out of bread and milk and many found themselves boiling foraged herbs for sustenance. Diaries from the time describe it in different ways. Weather backward or all was froze and the hills were barren like winter. In July, it was so cold that everything had stopped growing. Lake and river ice was observed as far south as northwestern Pennsylvania. The frost in many places lingered until the end of August. The year without a summer both directly and indirectly created crop failures, which caused dramatic increases in food prices, famines, cultural disruptions. But it also kick-started epidemics of cholera and other diseases. <laughs> There were many stories going around. People were saying that maybe the sun itself had cooled, that summer would never come again. In Canada, many thought that God was punishing people for deserting their farms during the War of 1812. The cause behind the year without a summer wasn't discovered until decades later. On the island of Sambawa near Bali, Indonesia, one of the greatest volcanic eruptions in history occurred its toll, perhaps as many as 90,000 lives. Mount Tambora ejected immense amounts of volcanic ash into the upper atmosphere, where it was carried around the world by the jet stream. The volcanic dust covered Earth like an umbrella, dimming and sometimes blacking out the sun. Many chose to abandon their farms after the year without a summer and move to a place at a lower elevation that had not been as harshly affected by the disaster. One such family were the Smiths. Joseph, Lucy, and their 11 children, who left their farm in Vermont and moved to the western region of New York State. The region was a hotbed of religious enthusiasm in the middle of a Protestant religious revival during which they attempted to convert people through emotional preaching called revivals or revival meetings where they held a series of religious services to inspire active members to gain new converts and to call sinners to repent. The Smith parents disagreed about religion, but the family was caught up in this excitement, as was their son, one of 11, Joseph. The man who would grow up to form a religious cult that still dominates today because this Joseph Smith is Joseph Smith, prophet of God, and founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as Mormonism. Welcome back to Season 2 of Respect the Dead, the podcast where we don't. Oh, shit! Let's go! <laughs> Sweaty, it's no surprise that everyone celebrated your demise. And now, worms are eating your eyes. So don't you worry your rotting head As you sleep in your sodden bed It's time to respect the dead I'm obsessed with A Year Without a Summer because I heard a song about it when I was a kid from this goth band, Rasputina. And when I saw that that's what caused him to move, I was so excited. I've never even heard of it. Yeah, that's really cool. It was metal as fuck. Welcome back to Respect the Dead. I'm Kaylin Conrad. I'm Andy. And I'm Hoots. Are we ready? I think so. <laughs> I'm so ready. Let's fucking go. I want to hear 
I want to hear about this freak. Same. I was wondering if you would know based on the year without a summer, but I. I actually I have never heard of the year without a summer. Same. Never. But the second you said Joseph Smith the first time, I think you, when you go back to edit this, I went. <gasps> I will slice that back in <laughs> to right now. <sighs> Yeah, Hoots' face was perfect. It took me a few more before I got there. <laughs> I was originally, before I realized that the year without a summer forced them to move, I was originally going to do like a very long intro pretending this was about Jesus. <laughs> and then like, <laughs> do a last minute switch. Ooh, that's fun. You should do that in a video um, sometime. Do you, wait, like. Do you guys know any Mormons or Exmo? I know, not personally, but I've I've uh, slithered around on ex Mormon like social media and mm -hmm. spoken to a few because I was going to do a video at one point um, to come to talk about uh, ex Mormons who left because they were queer or trans, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I talked to a few of them on Reddit, but I never I never ended up doing it. Yeah, because it wasn't really like my place. Yeah, <laughs> I've got a lot of. I've, throughout the years, I've had like a lot of friends who are uh, Mormon, more who are Exmo, and I guess like surprising no one. Yes, all of the Exmo people I know, maybe bar one or two, are women. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm, yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Women who were like, "Wait a minute." <laughs> <laughs> well, Mormonism isn't exactly popular in Canada. It's... <laughs> there, no, there's a lot here. The Jehovahs are definitely scuttling around here, mm -hmm. but like. You you don't th we still have Mormons, but mm -hmm. it's not it's not going to be as likely as in the states. Yeah, and like I I've met a few ex Mormons and Mormons, but I don't think I have any like close friends or anyone that is. Um, I do have a, a couple of friends though that are uh, ex Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm. So I have that, but a lot of Mormons. Uh, I think I've come across a lot of them because a lot of Mormons are in the arts. Mm. There's, there's especially like uh, especially in musical theater because there's a lot of there's a lot of singing. Yeah, I know there's a lot of singing in churches in general, but Mormons specifically, there's a, like a lot of a lot of singing. Oh, they love it. They love yeah. music and they're good at it. I'm gonna send you a uh, not a photo, but an oil painting of Joseph Smith. Um, there's no. There's no like real proof that this is what he looked like. I think they face tuned him just a little bit. Yeah, he looks he looks handsome. He looks like a more handsome Eddie Redmayne. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. He he does look a lot like Benadryl Cumberbund. Uh huh. So he is he is giving that kind of like that prissy look at his little prissy little lips, but a little <laughs> bit less alien. Yes. <laughs> I feel like Benedict Cumberbatch has got like a an alien look about him, which is why he's so good in fantasy series. He's yeah. got really big eyes. I think that's why. Yeah, he's got mm -hmm. big eyes. eyes. Really funky. He's got a tiny little mouth. Oh, wee little baby mouth. <laughs> yeah, his face oh. is very like it's almost like a praying mantis. He has like praying mantis. Face. <laughs> I do see it actually. Very angular. Yeah. 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 I would. Oh yeah. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> yeah. saying no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have a couple of drinks. We'll see what happens. <laughs> I don't even need a couple of drinks. <laughs> I don't even need a couple of drinks. Sure, I've had them, but I didn't need them. Okay, so this guy is a little weirdo. It's I'm going to explain his life, but I'm not going to get into all of the harms that Mormonism has caused. If you need to see that, it's very easy to find Mormon uh, or ex-Mormon people speaking about this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I will go into the beliefs of the religion, which are obviously inherently harmful, but without making this like an eight-parter, I don't think I could do it justice. So I'm just going to talk about the man and his ridiculous fucking life. Would we be able okay. to, when this eventually comes out, would we be able to link to a couple of videos from ex-Mormon oh, yeah, people will. in the show notes? Okay. Yeah. Cool. yeah, of course. Nice. Yeah. Joseph was always kind of obsessed with religion, but like the same way that like kids are obsessed with like making potions in their parents' bathrooms, mm -hmm. like out of <laughs> <laughs> out of like <laughs> like baby powder and like specifically this right. kid <laughs> telling the story. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I've seen enough TikToks to know I'm not the only one. <laughs> it is it is extreme. Like I'm a baby witch slash faggot <laughs> behavior, um, but. 
around the time there was a lot of religious folk magic because it hadn't been like stomped out yet Mm. because this is the early 1800s american spiritualist movement baby yeah Mm -hmm. so he's super into it because his family is like engaging in folk magic um which was like healing medicine uh especially divination which now if you were trying to do as a christian people would would like lose their fucking minds they they would get the pitchforks out um which eventually they did of course Mm. um which is wild because didn't Jesus do a bunch of that? Yeah, but God's allowed to do stuff. Maybe that's why. <laughs> You're, You're not, not supposed, supposed to be like, like, I'm just as good as Jesus, if not better, because I've lived longer, so I've practiced harder. I'm not <laughs> saying that I'm as good as Jesus. I'm saying that I bought his recipe book and I'm just trying out a few of his recipes. <laughs> <laughs> With a little, little yeah. tweaks in there. Yeah. <laughs> sure, I made some changes. <laughs> substitutions. Some hot sauce. <laughs> I didn't have water, so I used wine. <laughs> <laughs> but okay his practice of divination was taking a white hat and putting two stones in it and then like dunking his face in the hat <laughs> <laughs> and then searching for the future inside but hold on he called it peeping <laughs> uh, oh that pervert <laughs> he's oh such a freak okay. he's so- a pervert with brain damage <laughs> <laughs> was it yeah like did he dunk his head really fast like, i would assume go, so man so that oh, he would see that things. must have fucking hurt <laughs> you know what oh, like man. we laugh but like <laughs> was he giving himself more brain damage than i do every time i log on to twitter.com like no but <laughs> they didn't have anything to help with that back then <laughs> he could not go to therapy it's such a funny mental image. <laughs> Imagine he did that in front of you and you weren't expecting it. You're like, oh, oh, what is he going to do next? You just put two stones to that hat. He's going to watch. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> Sir? <laughs> Sir, should I call somebody? It's like, uh, do I... <laughs> Should I, I'm going to, I'm definitely going to leave, but should I announce it? So he's not like talking to me from in there thinking that I'm still in the room. Just go, just go, just go fast. Go fast while he's distracted. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, God's telling me that your crops are going to do so well this year. They look freaking amazing. Are you doing something different with them? Okay, we got to get the fuck out of here. What was that sound? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so. His father and him would do this to try and divine the locations of treasure because this is around the time where there was, I guess, treasure, whatever that means. I would too. (laughs) But the place that they would search was usually places where indigenous people were buried. Oh, of course. Sacred grounds. Okay. So not Mm -hmm. cute. Nope. Yeah, no really fucking nasty just like grave robbing in general i know this is respect the dead but like i'm gonna take a firm stance against grave robbing from other cultures yeah Yeah. grave rob your own culture if you want to grave rob your aunt or something then like (laughs) go right ahead sheila should have been buried deeper (laughs) right in case you listen to the carl tanzler episode and you were like actually grave robbing sounds like a great idea like (laughs) (laughs) literally what could go wrong so both his parents and his maternal grandfather reported having visions or dreams that they believed communicated messages from god himself which was kind of setting the stage here um it's classic christian cult mm, stuff i wondered while i was doing this research how much of this was just he was taught to believe that everything in his imagination was real Mm. And how much was just straight up mental illness? Yeah. Mm. And how much was him just being like a compulsive liar yeah. with a need for attention and to be the main character? I feel like it's be- probably a little bit of everything from all those piles. Yeah. 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 It doesn't have to just be one. <laughs> just like a, a big helping from every buffet table while you're there. Yeah. Just a little bit of this. <laughs> just coming back to your table with three plates. Yeah. Like, I- I could have a a little of everything. (laughs) So Smith said that although he'd become concerned about the welfare of his soul, like practicing magics and being told by other religious denominations that he was going to go to hell forever, 
he was still trying to figure out which of these like competing branches of Christianity he was going to actually find out is the real one. Like he seemed like very concerned with this, at least in his retelling of it. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of this is from his retelling. Mm -hmm. I try and make it clear whenever that's happening. Um, Because his retellings are frequent and don't match. Of <laughs> what, like, just like L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah. Like, every time he tells a story about his youth, it changes. He gets, like, younger right. and better he at... He gets younger. Yeah. The feats yeah. get more incredible. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. I was two years old and I read the dictionary and the every encyclopedia or whatever. Yeah. In order to present <laughs> himself as more of a chosen one, like, to give himself that narrative. Mm, right. Yeah. Just like L. Ron Hubbard did. Mm-hmm. So years after his youth, he told everyone that during his youth, when he was 14, sometimes he wasn't 14, though. Mm -hmm. I'll just read how he describes it, or uh, how the church describes it. On a spring day in 1820, 14-year-old Joseph Smith sought solitude in a grove of trees and prayed to know which church was true, which, like, (laughs) nerd. (laughs) (laughs) Like, you should be getting high in that grove of trees or, like, sucking dick or something. You're not like, God, please help me. I don't know which religion is the most truest. Right. That's someone who should get bullied. I know, right? I would have like popped out from behind one of those trees and like Nerd. put my foot on his back and kicked him onto the ground. <laughs> like, I mean, I want to say that like maybe getting high or sucking dick in those trees is a detail he left out, and that's part of what led him to know which that's fair Christian denomination is truest. You know, yeah, just like glug right. glugging and then glug glugging your way to the Lord, really opening up and letting God come in. Yeah, yeah. You know how things dawn on you when you. When you glug glug sometimes, yeah. Post swallowing yeah. someone else's nut yeah. clarity. Yeah. Or while while you're sucking a dick and you're just like thinking about other things. <laughs> like, I need to go to the grocery <laughs> store tomorrow. It can be very meditative. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because it's so repetitive. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> like washing <Yeah>. dishes. <laughs> the two things I know how to do, boys. <laughs> <laughs> she's available. No. Oh, God. I have always said she's not like other girls. She's better. Mm-hmm. So apparently, during this time, God and his son, Jesus, Mm. two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description, appeared and spoke with him. Wondering which of the many churches to join, Joseph had followed the counsel in the Bible's book of James. If you lack any wisdom, let them ask God. Basically, God came back and was like, everybody's wrong. (laughs) Okay. But you can do something about this. That's a convenient answer. Nobody's right. Yeah. No. (laughs) (laughs) And you're gonna be. So in a state of calmness and peace indescribable, which they keep saying that things are indescribable and then go on to describe them. (laughs) Um, (laughs) They're like, God appeared and I couldn't describe it, but he was like glowy and bright (laughs) and like super fucking handsome. And God and Jesus, like you can tell they were related. There's like one of the lines that was like, like, oh, they were definitely related. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So he left the, his, He left this sacred grove, which is now sacred, I guess, um, like from this vision, Mm -hmm. and goes back to his life, not telling anyone about it. Okay. I would neither. If I went into some trees and I saw Jesus and God, I'd be like, I'm going to take a few days and I'm not going to discuss this with anyone. (laughs) I'm going to rethink my life. His entire family speaks to God, though. So it's not even like a weird... Oh, that's right. Occurrence. That's right. His like dad and grandfather are like calling God on the reg. Okay, that's shady then. That's shady right? if he's like, hmm, I'm just not going to tell anybody about this. <laughs> mm-hmm. If God wanted to appear to them, he yeah. would have. <laughs> this is direct copy from <laughs> the church. It's my favorite. Joseph Smith's first vision stands today as the greatest event in world history <laughs> since the birth, <laughs> ministry, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why are you laughing? After- <laughs> Why are you laughing, Mary Kaylin? <laughs> it's not funny. It's it's a fact. It's the greatest event. Are you fucking kidding me? When I <laughs> feel such joy for the Lord, I can't help but giggle at all the sinners. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. It's the greatest event. The greatest mm-hmm. event, like um, of all time. Mm, I don't know about that. <laughs> do we remember the ball pit? 
<laughs> because I remember the ball pit. I remember the ball pit. Do we remember the show uh, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Because yeah, I do. Exactly. Lots yeah. of stuff happened in that, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Pretty great stuff. After centuries of darkness, the Lord opened the heavens to reveal his word and restore his church through his chosen prophet. So now he's a prophet. Okay. okay. 14 years old, except he doesn't tell anyone for a very long time. And personally, I think he this was just him post realizing he was going to start a religious cult, padding his backstory. Yeah. And there are about nine versions of this account. Yeah. Among the inconsistencies seen when looking at them like side by side, uh, his age changes, the place where he has the vision changes, uh, whether or not it was God or God and Jesus and what they told him. So every detail about the story <laughs> changes at some point. <laughs> Sometimes you just forget to mention things that <laughs> and you're like, oh, oh, by the way. Did I not say Jesus was there too? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he said he really liked my hair. <laughs> And so was Noah. <laughs> and the giraffes that stuck their head out of the window of the ark, all cute like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> During the 1830s, Smith described his vision to some of his followers, but these were all oral stories. This nothing was being mm -hmm. like transcribed or written down or like put into um, any form that somebody could like hold two of them side by side yeah. and be like, wait a second. <clears throat> but Mormons wouldn't actually hear this story as like, a published piece until the 1840s. So this is well after <laughs> it supposedly happened. Right. And it, it wasn't important to his followers until even much later on. So it seems like his backstory is being retconned in to justify why he should be running a church. <laughs> why uh, she, why he should have followers. Yeah. That tracks with, cult leaders oh yeah they they literally all do this this amazing mm -hmm. thing happened when i was 12 and i just didn't feel the need to talk about it until i was 45 in the head of a cult it's never told anybody <laughs> you know it never occurred to me that jesus didn't come to everyone yeah. i guess yeah i just thought that was. i just thought that was part of puberty a little come to christ moment yeah during the 1830s <laughs> smith described this to his followers and the vision grew later in importance, and it was regarded as the first event in the restoration of Christ's church to earth. So this is like his goal. He is bringing Christ's real church back to the planet. Every other church is fake. God and his baby told him that himself. So like the church Here, that the 13 were part well, the 12 apostles and Jesus were part of, right? Yeah. Okay. Which but. is like... That's cute. We love that. Yeah. A little like vintage moment. Mm -hmm. This wasn't the only vision he would have. He was actually really good at having visions. Oh. Here is uh, a direct quote from him. He is a much better writer than L. Ron Hubbard, but not a good writer. On the evening of the above mentioned 21st of September, after I had retired to my bed for the night, I betook myself to prayer and supplication <laughs> to Almighty God for forgiveness of all my sins and follies, and also for a manifestation to me, that I might know of my state and standing before him, for I had full confidence in obtaining a divine manifestation, as I previously had had one. Which I love the way he writes. It's very Moira Rose. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm like, <laughs> like I, I betook myself to <laughs> prayer and supplication. Betook is a great word. <laughs> yes, that's great. I'm, I am using this in everyday life. Yeah. I'm like, I'm, <laughs> I betook myself. BRB, I'm going to betake myself to the store. <laughs> <laughs> While I was thus in the act of calling upon God, I discovered a light appearing in my room, which continued to increase until the room was lighter than at noon noonday when immediately a personage appeared at my bedside standing in the air for his feet did not touch the floor it's so extra i bet everybody reading this was like just say person like nobody here calls it noonday noonday <laughs> noon i kind of do want to speak like this and just see yeah. how quickly people will start unfollowing me <laughs> <laughs> he had on a loose robe of the most exquisite whiteness it was a whiteness beyond anything earthly i had ever seen nor do i believe that any earthly thing could be made to appear so exceedingly white that feels like it would hurt your eyes like when things are too white i'm like right 
Oh, I can't right. focus on that. Maybe that's the the devil in me. Maybe that's Satan's influence that I can't look at white too much. No, that's exactly right. His hands were naked <laughs> and his arms also a little above the wrist. <laughs> so also were his feet naked, as were his legs, a little above the ankles. Ooh. His head and neck were also bare. So <laughs> there's a lot of focus on how little <laughs> clothing. I know what wearing a robe looks like. Yeah. <laughs> so he's wearing a robe. <laughs> I could discover that he had no other clothing on but this robe as it was open. As it was open? <gasps> so that I could see into his bosom. Wow. Was that all you could see? It was open. <laughs> it was open and you just said that he wasn't wearing anything else. Yeah. <laughs> Describe like, the ah. dick. <laughs> Describe it. <laughs> Tell me. Oh, you know it was big. Is it veiny? <laughs> His feet didn't touch the floor, but that dick did. <laughs> <laughs> it was swinging. It was swinging too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Biblically accurate, like huge slunger. Oh no, biblically, biblically accurate, accurate dick. erection. <laughs> <laughs> that means there's Not so only... many shafts. <laughs> not only was his robe exceedingly white but this whole person was glorious beyond description and his countenance truly like lightning he was down bad <laughs> he's like not only was that robe exceedingly white but so was jesus jesus is white <laughs> he called me by my name and said unto me that he was a messenger sent from the presence of god to me and that his name was Morani. <laughs> Got God. him. <laughs> hey, I'm Morani. Drag <laughs> the guy with his dick dragging on the floor is a real Morani. <laughs> <laughs> that God had work for me to do, and that my name should be had for good and evil among all nations, kindreds, and tongues. <laughs> He said that there was a book deposited, written upon gold plates, giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent and the source from whence they sprang. <laughs> from whence they sprang. He, he, he also said that the fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained in it as delivered by the Savior to the ancient inhabitants. Also, that there were two stones in silver bows, and these stones, fastened to a breastplate, constitute what is called the Urim and Thummim, deposited with the plates, and the possession and use of these stones were what constituted seers in ancient or former times. God had basically, like, made these stones so that he could read the tablets, the golden book. Okay. The vision was open to my mind that I could see the place where the plates were deposited. Basically, he says, go get them, mm -hmm. translate this book, and give it to the people. If you show them to anyone else, you'll be destroyed, okay. which is, like, super convenient. Yeah. Right? Like, oh, I can't show this to you. God told me not to. I like that it kind of already feels like a video game, and you've been handed a quest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To dig up these tablets in order to decode the thing. <laughs> uh, but also, like, you got to keep the tablets away from all the other people who want to see them. Question. Mm -hmm. Yes. If you're going to put the tablets and the stones that you put on your eyes to – read the tablets in the same box mm -hmm. do you need the extra security it's like having a safe and p writing the combination on it like who is this for what right what are we doing here you couldn't just write it in english you can just like pop it into his mind if you can give him a vision yeah can you not download the information maybe it's about proving himself or something yeah I again i think god wants to gamify it he's like let's yeah, let's kind of yeah. a little let's let's He's give boring. him a little hobby, yeah. you know. Let's yeah, it's see how high <laughs> you do. Not, high not God setting up some enrichment for him in his enclosure. <laughs> <laughs> they love puzzles. <laughs> <laughs> this little boy is driving me crazy. I'm just gonna set out some safety scissors and some construction paper for him. <laughs> make sure everyone reads the book you make. <laughs> okay, and this is my this is my favorite part. After this communication, I saw the light in the room begin to gather immediately around the person of him who had been speaking to me. Him who had been speaking. <laughs> and it continued to do so until the room was again left dark. Why did you say it that way? Baby had a word count. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
And it continued to do so until the room was again left dark, except just around him, when instantly I saw, as it were, a conduit open right up into heaven, and he ascended till he entirely disappeared, and the room was left as it had been before this heavenly light has made its appearance. And then... For like three more pages, he explains how directly after that happening, the angel like immediately comes back and yeah. says the whole same thing over again and like redoes it and then like disappears <laughs> again and like sucks up into heaven. He's like, and finally I was alone until <laughs> and then he comes back again and does it again. What? It's like when I'm scrolling Twitter and somebody is like, somebody's posted like a TikTok and I'm like watching it and like I don't realize until I've watched it three times that it keeps replaying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, oh shit. <laughs> oh my God. But what was my surprise when again I beheld the same messenger at my bedside and heard him rehearse or repeat over again to me the same things as before. I can't handle it. Um, he basically was like, hey, so... FYI, before I go, Satan's going to try and tempt you to, like, sell the plates or show them to other people. But, like, no matter what, don't do that. Satan loves tempting. Entering my tempting <laughs> era. <laughs> slithering into the garden. I'm such a little temp cell. <laughs> temp cell is delicious. I love that. God chats are seething. <laughs> After this third visit, he ascended again into heaven as before, and <laughs> I was again left to ponder on the strangeness of what I had just experienced. I bet by the third time he was like, is he coming back? <laughs> yeah, I, I would have been sitting there like, like I needed to pee like two visitations ago. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's a good way to make sure that he won't forget. <laughs> <laughs> he knew he was a stupid bitch. Yeah. He was like, I'm... I, I'm going to need to tell this stupid little brat this a couple couple times. When almost immediately after the heavenly messenger had ascended from me for the third time, the cock crowed, and I found that day was approaching, so that our interviews must have occupied the whole of the night. I shortly after arose from my bed and, as usual, went to the necessary labors of the day. But in attempting to work as at other times, I found my strength so exhausted as to render me entirely unable. Basically, he wanted to get her to work, so he made the story up. No, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. My, that's my, why it couldn't work. Because oh God, God, that's such a good idea. I'm gonna do that. God kept me up all night. <laughs> that's it. It's kind of genius. God was talking to me all night. This guy came to me, Moroni, <laughs> Moroni, the big dick angel. <laughs> He has this one monologue he's really proud of and he keeps doing over and over again, but I let him do it. Yeah, I heard his type five at least seven times. (laughs) Basically, he goes to go to work and then he's like, oh, I'm so sleepy. And his dad's like, go home. But then he falls unconscious on the ground while he's leaving. (laughs) That happens to me in Stardew Valley all the time. I told you it's like a video game. (laughs) I know, bitch, you're not special. (laughs) I've fallen asleep, like, on the way out of my farm several fucking times Mm -hmm. in a day. One time I fell asleep right next to the bed. (laughs) Oh, yeah, that's the worst. So he goes to find the plates. He goes to to dig them up. Uh Uh-huh. I left the field and went to the place where the messenger had told me the plates were deposited. And owing to the distinctness of the vision, which I had had concerning it, I knew the place the instant that I arrived there. He reported that during the next four years, he made annual visits to the hill, but until the fourth and final visit, each time he returned without the plates. So there's some like contention here about whether he was going there and reading them and didn't bring them back or if he Mm -hmm. was going there and couldn't find them. Okay. Okay. Because they were buried. So like he was like, where are they? <laughs> like <I'm> looking around. <laughs> He's like a squirrel trying to find his nuts again. Like, are they over here? Nope. <laughs> He's like, like dig, you stupid bitch. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, they said they'd be here. I remember that tree from my vision. <laughs> Like standing on top of like a large like X burned into the ground with yeah. like an arrow pointing Where? towards it. And like <laughs> a flaming bush is like underneath <laughs> you. A hump of disturbed earth. <laughs> <laughs> 
clearly standing out as if in a video game. <laughs> Next to a shovel. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like sparkles yeah, right. <laughs> and like a quest marker yeah an arrow floating <laughs> yeah <laughs> i like it's nice said they're like the same thing basically at the, same time. <laughs> the trials of god have really taken it out of me <laughs> like he could have made this a little easier meanwhile while he's like out digging around on this hill smith's family is facing like really intense financial hardship due in part to the death of his oldest brother, Alvin, who was like doing a lot of the work on the farm because homeboy is useless, like going to <laughs> hang out in oh, groves and dig yeah. around on the mountain. So they're like, <laughs> oh, we'd really like you to come back and work on a farm if that's OK. I know you're busy <laughs> poking around a hill <laughs> <laughs> looking for tablets. <laughs> tablets, you say? So the family members supplemented their shitty farm income by hiring out for odd jobs and working as treasure seekers, you know, oh, no. with like magic stones. Yeah. <laughs> Smith was said to have an ability to locate lost items by looking into a seer stone, which he used in the treasure hunting, including beginning in 1825, several unsuccessful attempts to find buried treasure sponsored by Josiah Stowell, a wealthy farmer. In 1826, Smith was brought before a, Chenango County Court for glass looking or pretending to find lost treasure. Stowell's relatives accused Smith of tricking Stowell into faking an ability to receive hidden treasure, though Stowell attested that he believes Smith had such abilities. So <laughs> he was like, scammers. no, he can, he can do it. I swear. <laughs> he, he hasn't done it yet, but he, but can. he can do it. <laughs> They're scammers. Which is like, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, same. Like, I'm sorry, but charging someone to like, dunk your head in a hat and be like north north wind <laughs> <laughs> so he's about to get married so i'm gonna send you a photo we go. show us the way while boarding at the hale house located in the township of harmony now oakland in pennsylvania smith met and courted emma hale which she, is a gorgeous name but she looks very not a stern. gorgeous woman yeah her <laughs> eyes are on two different axes <laughs> she's <laughs> giving are. lady graham linehan yes <laughs> Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> that right eye melting off her face. Okay, can I just say something really silly? For a split second, I was looking at the hands, and I'm like, why is one of her hands really big and the other one really small? And then I realized it was the baby in her lap. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. So stupid. So I would this... believe he married some freak with tiny hands. I was like, oh, God. Because this is an again. audio format. Uh, you can only see her right hand, which is wrapped around an infant that she's holding. And then where where her her left hand should be uh, is her baby's hand, and her actual hand is going yeah. underneath the baby, so it looks like she has a tiny <laughs> withered hand. It does. It does. It, it, Not that there's it, anything it, wrong with that. It just, it, it just yeah. no, there's nothing wrong with it, but it would match her eye. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when he proposed marriage, her father objected because he was like he's a scrub yeah like he's a scammer and he's a scrub um he said he appeared careless and not very well educated <laughs> <laughs> he's like this stupid clumsy fuck no because he's like, <laughs> been all his fucking time wandering around groves talking to god so smith and emma eloped and married on january 18th 1827 after which the couple began boarding with smith's parents in manchester Later that year, when Smith promised to abandon treasure seeking, his father-in-law offered to let the couple live on his property in Harmony and help Smith get started in business. Smith made his last visit to the hill shortly after midnight on September 22nd, 1827, taking Emma with him. This time, he said he successfully retrieved the plates. Okay. Smith said Morani commanded him not to show the plates to anyone else, but to translate them and publish their translation. Okay. He also said the plates were a religious record of Middle Eastern Indigenous Americans and were engraved in an unknown language called Reformed Egyptian. Right. But told associates that he was capable of reading and translating them. Makes total sense. Right. They talk about this on South Park. And in oh, that musical, they? yeah, I think they do. I know they definitely talk about it in the um, the Book of Mormon musical, which is also by the South Park guys. South Park guys, they they fucking love themselves some Mormons. 
They sure oh, do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Although Smith had abandoned treasure hunting, former associates believed he had double-crossed them and taken the golden plates for himself. So they thought when he started saying he found golden plates, they were like, but I hired you to find Not treasure. this treasure. They're like, um, yeah, we should split <laughs> them. He's like, my my magic book from God? Yes. I no should can split do. That? I don't think Marani is going to be okay with this. Marani said this wasn't good. Yeah, Marani <laughs> said no. Daddy chill. <laughs> Daddy chill. I love that uh, like Marani is like a mix between moron and jabroni. Like, like that's going to be a new <laughs> insult. Like he's a real Maroni. Maroni. <laughs> oh, guys. <laughs> the real Maroni. The real Maroni. This is like new uh like Mormons uh, on the Jersey Shore for spring break. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. real Maronis. Mormon Jersey himbos. Make it Ooh, happen. Yeah. Ooh, with Ooh. those those little outfits. That yeah. special little underwear. Yeah. I was thinking about the underwear. Make yeah. it happen, TLC. <laughs> I know you've got the money for another reality show in you. <laughs> so everyone that he he had left feeling double crossed starts ransacking the places where they think he might be keeping the plates. Okay. Um, but in other news, it's very difficult to find and steal something that never existed. Mm, I can <laughs> so, see how that would yeah. be a, a big stumbling block. <laughs> yeah. When you want to hide something from people. Hide a fake thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hide something that doesn't exist and let them go looking for it. Yeah. Right. But he, many times in his life, this being one of the first, has just pissed off too many people in this town. And he needs to piece the fuck out. So he leaves his home in Palmyra. In October 1827, Smith and Emma permanently moved to Harmony, aided by a well-off neighbor, Martin Harris, who, who was also Smith's scribe. Although he and his wife, Lucy, were early supporters of Smith, by 1828, they began to have doubts about the existence of the golden plate. <laughs> Wait a minute. It's very... He keeps talking about these <laughs> plates, and I've never seen any evidence of them. He was, he was <laughs> like, translating it to what's-his-nuts, uh, Martin Harris, but Martin Harris couldn't see them because this is how he read the plates, the plates were somewhere else, and he would read them by putting his two stones in his hat and then going in. I mean, like, God, God says it's the only true religion, and I'm always right. Cool. And I can have a little wine. Cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, it never occurred to him to, like, you know, maybe prove that these plates exist by like, I know he can't show the plates directly to somebody, but maybe do like one of those things that you do with like with headstones. A or rubbing. Kind of, yeah, like a little rubbing, a rubbing. and yeah. be like, this yeah. is what it looks like. This is what I'm working with. But God said I can't show you the real thing. So you're just going to have to trust me here. It would have been very funny if he did, because like, you know, it would have not been a rubbing. It would have just been like crayon on <laughs> a right, little crayon, crayon drawing. Paper. <laughs> it's like, I don't understand this. Why is there like a, a picture? Of like a chicken and then a sun. It's like, oh, <laughs> those this are, is reformed Egyptian. Yeah, those are hieroglyphics. Yeah. Which <laughs> I, I I invented that word. Uneducated you know. yokel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I invented the word Egyptian. Oh, I'm sorry. You you're can't welcome. read hieratic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you actually can't read it because you're going to hell. Have you ever considered that? Mm. God's little mistake. <laughs> so Harris persuaded Smith to let him take 116 pages of the manuscript, um, which was all of it, to Palmyra to show a few family members, including his wife, and be like, hey, look, this is a real thing. Like, please stop telling me to come home. I'm working for God right now. This is a great opportunity. The exposure I'm going to get paid in is going to be, like, fucking amazing. I'm putting in a lot of overtime for God right now, and I feel like you're not appreciating that. Yeah, I'm doing this for us. Yeah. <laughs> like, we are going to be so fucking rich in heaven. I am not having an affair with a woman in another town. <laughs> <laughs> but while Harris had the manuscript, he lost it. Oh. So obviously the only copy, there is no Google Drive. Mm -hmm. um, oh, no. Yeah. And Smith, ar around the same time, had just lost his first son. Oh, uh, coupled sad. with losing the manuscript, sort of had like a a losing faith moment, or at least like that's what he said. Mm -hmm. I think 
he was just scared that if he had to repeat it all, it would be very inconsistent. Yeah. <laughs> like at least to the same guy, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like you have to like take a break and then like find someone else to do it. And then Smith was like, um, do you know what happened? After you lost the manuscript, Moroni came back and took the plates away and removed my ability to translate them. So now they're gone forever. Fucking Moroni. Oh my God. Why would he do that? I can't believe he would do that. It is very Moroni, but like. Such a classic Moroni move. So mean. This is why I don't invite him to brunch anymore. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> this attitude, this is the exact you're, attitude you're why right. he doesn't get invited. You're right to do that. It's the only way he'll ever learn. Yeah. No more brunchoni Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> We're done. So then he found like even more mysterious plates completely unrelated more, mysterious. more powerful than the first one he's like those were gold plates these are platinum i know when we say plates we're probably talking about something different than what's in my mind yeah yeah it's not like dinner plates it's not it's not like flatware yeah. like the new size he's holding up it's like the kind that my mom had the, with the, the good apples plates. the good pl- the good plates <laughs> yeah <laughs> We're upgrading you have your company dining coming set. Over. You have, yes. <laughs> honey, we have company coming over. Can we eat off the plates God gave us? <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be so fucking jealous when they come here and see these. Get out the nice silverware and the God plates. <laughs> <laughs> the God plates. <laughs> these mysterious plates were found by locals in Kinderhook, Illinois, along with a skeleton. Oh, Smith believe it. It's very video game. He like stumble upon a <laughs> yeah. skeleton with these like mysterious plates. Mm-hmm. Smith believing them to be genuine ancient artifacts mm-hmm. later translated a portion of the brass plate writings, claiming that it tells the story of the skeleton uh-huh. when he wasn't a skeleton. I love to be buried with a plate about me. <laughs> <laughs> this dumb bitch. <laughs> Here's the story of the world's stupidest fucking whore. <laughs> I love to type up my memoir on a on a brass plate and just get swallowed by the earth. <laughs> like a, mm, just like a like a weighted blanket of dirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, that sounds so relaxing. Like being under the earth but your face is like right there Mm. Mm. love it children will do that for you at the beach and then they'll run away as the tide is coming in (laughs) just leave you there (laughs) are we unlocking a a memory (laughs) here (laughs) (laughs) like a a little bit of sand falls out from like behind your ear (laughs) (laughs) according to smith the skeleton was a descendant of ham through the loins of pharaoh In 1980, however, scientists examined the plates and determined that they were not ancient at all and were eventually proven to be nothing more than a hoax. (laughs) And that Joseph made them? They were just from Kmart. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) They were literally from Michael's Crafts. (laughs) (laughs) It literally says made in Japan right in the back. (laughs) This Hobby Lobby shit. (laughs) (laughs) And he included these translations as like, proof of his ability to like access the divine Uh so now when it's brought up mormons are like um he never said that's what the plate said he was just like divining information from god about the person but like the actual plates were just like describing um like a a ritual like a, a burial ritual okay um but they still weren't legitimate no it's so he went on Wikipedia. Because uh, the understanding of hieroglyphics changed like quite drastically after finding the Rosetta Stone. Right. So like everybody was just like making up what they <laughs> thought yeah. these hieroglyphics meant. And then eventually when they figured it out, they were like, okay, so a lot of you were lying. Yeah. If not all. <laughs> he literally looked up some pictures of hieroglyphics on Wikipedia and was like, okay, I'm going to draw this. <laughs> Post losing the manuscript, Smith briefly began attending Methodist meetings instead um because he was like this is over i'm not rewriting this whole book Mm -hmm. like we're done here but he got kicked out of the church because a cousin of his was like ew he's like a necromancer or something he cannot be in here he was not a necromancer i was about to say was he a necromancer (laughs) he never brought a dead body back to life he just found a dead body with a a fake plate basically the same thing she was just being a little extra because he was kind of (laughs) witchy 
Okay. Okay. Um, that's hateful. <laughs> she was yeah. like, I do not want this fucking nerd in here trying to make himself <laughs> the like prophet of my religion too. So he gets kicked out. He's no longer a Methodist because they're all like, um, I heard you like raise the dead, which is so not chill. <laughs> so Smith, not that long after, is like, oh my God, Maroney came back and he brought <laughs> me my plates. <laughs> and he also said that raising the dead is totally cool. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, people who raise the dead are like so fucking hot and cool and everybody should like them and listen to what they say and be their friend and want to make out with them i like to imagine maroney's return being kind of like um like when a, a favorite reoccurring side character in a sitcom comes yes. in like from the 90s it, the yes. door and and kicks open and the, audience the goes, cheering Woo! yeah 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 <laughs> maroney I yeah. like to picture him opening his weird heavenly portal and coming in dick first. <laughs> <laughs> well, it like, because he's coming down on an angle and it kind of like flops yeah. in ahead of him. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just... <laughs> <laughs> with his open robe <laughs> first you see the first you see the head and then you see his little toes coming in like somebody has got to get him a tie for that robe <laughs> where are Maroni's friends <laughs> Maroni's friends are like all gay dudes who do not want him to tie this robe back up who did you say a fucking word bitch <laughs> who has got Maroni for secret Santa like... <laughs> Maroni lying in bed at night being like I wonder if my friends would like me if I didn't have this huge honk and swang and dick and his friends who are like in that bed with him are like no no we wouldn't <laughs> <laughs> no daddy <laughs> literally the only thing keeping us here <laughs> I know. so he gets the plates back and then he dictates them to now his wife emma can he do that Is, oh wait yeah he can do that he's allowed to he's allowed to dictate he's allowed to dictate. yeah he can tell her obviously that's his job <laughs> yeah in april 1829 he met oliver cowdery um and that name it's like very hard not to say alistair crowley mm, when i'm oliver reading Cowdery. oliver cowdry yeah <laughs> it sounds like it sounds like if you were like if you were talking to a journalist <laughs> about somebody and you're like i don't want to call them out so let's just say their name is oliver cowdry <laughs> <laughs> like not even trying to hide it yeah and oliver cowdry had also dabbled in folk magic and with Cowdrey as scribe, Smith began a period of rapid fire translation. So I guess Emma was a little slow writing, <laughs> probably because like she had never been taught <laughs> how to read or write. She was like, and yeah. can you spell that? And can you also show me the shapes of the letters <laughs> in that word <laughs> so that I can write them down? <laughs> can you spell that? Yes, it's M. Okay. And M is, 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 that, <laughs> is that the camel? <laughs> <laughs> it's the camel or is that the one that's just a little mouth going oh <laughs> <laughs> oh which one's that it's like it's the same shape your mouth makes when you say it try yeah. it with me oh, oh. <laughs> there's the there's the one that's the the oh and then there's the one that's the like little gay oh with a tail <laughs> <laughs> oh sassy oh with the little limp wrist hanging above his head <laughs> <laughs> like this between April and early June 1829, the two worked full time on the manuscript, then moved to Fayette, New York together, where they continued the work at the home of Cowdery's friend, Peter Whitmer. When the narrative described an institutional church and a requirement for baptism, Smith and Cowdery baptized each other. I bet it was sexy. Oh, that's cute. Yeah. Mm. I love it yeah. when couples baptize, baptize each other. Yeah. Dictation was completed about July 1st, 1829. According to Smith, Maroney came back and took the plates once Smith was finished using them. Took you long enough. I know, right? <laughs> the way he snatches them off the table. <laughs> Just like dick slaps on the table and wraps around them <laughs> like a prehensile tail. <laughs> He's like, send your invoice to this email. <laughs> <laughs> the completed work titled The Book of Mormon was published in Palmyra in March 1830. Oh, my God. I love it when they say the title of the movie in the movie. I know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Me too. Here's what the angel wanted to make sure we all knew. God had like a bunch of like spirit children in heaven. 
two of these, Jesus and Satan, got into like a blowout about how they wanted the next phase to be run of like mm-hmm. the big experiment that is humanity. So like life on earth. And this caused a war in heaven and the losing team, Satan, was cast down to earth without bodies becoming devils. Okay. So that's like before you come to earth, you live in this like pre-earth phase. And then after this, everyone was sent to earth to be born into a body. And the point of this is to be a final test of the internal character one has accrued in like all of the experiences in the life you had before coming to earth. So you have like a full life as like a spirit child Mm, it's like that disney movie soul yes um and all the memories of pre-earth life are erased as you come to earth so Mm. to pass this like test one has to become baptized as a mormon and then remain faithful to the end and like there's like bonus points and like extra special heaven if you get married in a mormon temple yeah there's like an an extra secret level (laughs) yes (laughs) It was a bonus level. <laughs> you like unlock other options <laughs> by doing specific things. Since not everyone has a chance to hear about Mormonism, there's other options available in the next phase um, because it's it's like it's not fair to send someone to hell just because they hadn't heard the great news about Joseph Smith and his magic tablets and his silly little stones. <laughs> so this also explains why Mormons focus so much on missionary work because like you can't just believe in god you have to be part of the mormon temple okay right but like isn't for most christians in in most of the christian like mythology didn't jesus die for our sins because so that you could just be christian like that's the whole died for our sins part yeah Mm. unfortunately all of that was wrong. Remember? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember how about about I forgot about how everybody but him is wrong. Everybody but him <laughs> is wrong. I mean, I do I, like I support something that like that like encourages its members. Maybe not compels so much, but I, I would I, I would I would appreciate something that like encourages its members to do good works. Mm. Yes. Yeah. This is more missionary work than like so, good work. So the good is like, arguable. <laughs> the good really depends on your perspective. Yeah. And whether or not you think trying to convert indigenous people is like super chill. Yeah. 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 I personally don't, but like, I personally that's just don't, my silly little but, like, opinion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Marani so, yeah. might think that that's like, well, you're saving their soul. Yeah. Okay. From their wicked ways. I feel like, (laughs) I don't know. I feel like Marani maybe should have been like, alternatively, you could open a soup kitchen. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. A women's shelter, maybe. (laughs) Not like a temple dedicated to like how dope you are. Yeah. (laughs) So in the afterlife, there's a preliminary judgment based on earth life. Um, faithful Mormons go to paradise. Everyone else goes to hell, but <laughs> hell, hell isn't as bad. Like it's not like fire and brimstone. It's just like super boring. Oh, it's just the absence of God. Yeah, and then in there, there are afterlife missionaries <laughs> that go to hell <laughs> to try and teach the people there, and then you get one last chance to get into heaven. That's kind of cute. I it, like that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah. Yeah. I would use this life to have fun and go to hell then. And then I'd be like, yeah, all right, absolutely. in the next life, I'll just be good. Right? <laughs> and then you just... Like, it's <laughs> it's very much like the religious version of, like, the diet starts Monday. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So if you get converted by an afterlife missionary in hell, they then have to wait to be baptized by proxy in a Mormon temple. Okay. How does that work? So... Okay, so Mormons are meant to do genealogy. Right, 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 right. So they can find out who their ancestors are. I know this from my friends. They're super into this. So that they can reverse baptize them. So until like everyone on earth is Mormon, you're going to be stuck in hell being like, come on. And if all of your ancestors or if all of your descendants die out before they can convert, convert to mormonism then you don't get baptized 
unless somebody happens to do it for you. Someone happens to think of you. That's crazy. I didn't know that's why they were so into yeah. genealogy. <laughs> like that is something that I know from like my Exmo friends that they're super into genealogy and like who you're descended from. Yeah. I had like a friend who like changed – like she – very distantly was like uh descended from like spanish people and their family at some point like a few generations before her changed their name to a more spanish sounding name <laughs> to like reflect <laughs> their history and i i knew like from talking to her she was like yeah this is like a super mormon thing but i didn't know that it was about like getting your dead ancestors into heaven <laughs> yeah. like this is this is some coco shit i love this yeah. This, okay, I approve of this. <laughs> I approve of this psycho it's, shit. It's oddly fascinating. Yeah. Well, I like a little <laughs> bit of world building, you know? Yeah. Right. There's some solid canon yeah. here. Love world building. Yeah. Solid canon. Yeah. The devs worked really hard to make sure we had a good story. Yes. Mm -hmm. I like that. I love that you have <laughs> you have second chances. Yeah. Yeah. It's so much like a video game. You have multiple lives. It's, <laughs> it's a one up. <laughs> yeah. So... That was the afterlife, heaven and hell. But then there's final heaven. <laughs> the final boss. The final heaven. Do -do -do -do. <laughs> Do -do 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 -do. So we're in final heaven. That's where you go after everyone has had a sufficient opportunity to be born and have a chance to accept or reject Mormonism. And then there's like the final judgment and people get sorted into four categories. Gryffindor, Ravenclaw, Slytherin. <laughs> oh, I love Swedish, Kaylin. <laughs> That's the gay one. That's the gay I, one. I do want to hear Swedish people read out like everything from Harry Potter, like Dublador. Dublador. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, what my my hoos is hoofalpoof. <laughs> the best Mormons go to the celestial kingdom where they become gods of their own planets. I remember this. I remember this. I've heard about this. Yeah. Which is so cool. Also a video game. It's very similar to Scientology. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> oh no, that was yep. a little Yes, yes, gang, gang. Yes, yes. <laughs> I slipped yes. into Pinky Doll for a second there. <laughs> Good non Mormons and the like less valiant Mormons go to the terrestrial kingdom, which is like still really nice. It's like three mm -hmm. stars. You just, four stars. You just don't become a god. Okay. Right, you don't get your whole yes. own planet. I know that you're supposed to want to go to like the extra good heaven, but like, if you're on a budget, I feel like that's acceptable. It would be cool to be a god. It would be really fun to be a god. It seems like a – yeah, it seems like it would be a lot of work to be a god. Like, mm, yeah. I kind of feel like most of them aren't really doing much. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, I would just, like, <laughs> sit in people's living rooms and watch TV with them invisibly. <laughs> like, <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah. I would make just a bunch of weird shit. I would just be like, let's put the snake and this giraffe together. See what happens. Drake. <laughs> I I suppose I would feel like it's the Sims where I would I would get to a certain point where like I'm like, why am I just doing a second online version of what I already have to do in real life? <laughs> like <laughs> But you're God, so you can just fuck off. I just imagine the the this what was it the giraffe is just like the neck of the giraffe just crawling Whoa. around with its tongue. <laughs> Oh, that's horrible. <laughs> Thank you for those nightmares, you sick fuck. I hate that you gave me that mental image, Mandy. I'm so sorry. I had to share. I'm going to drink bleach after this. <laughs> <laughs> like slithering around on the ground begging for death. <laughs> Not begging for death. It's like two-sided too, Kill and they're both me. trying to go in opposite directions. <laughs> Oh, God. Oh, no. And this is why we won't go to Mormon Ultra Heaven. <laughs> yeah, this is you. Yeah. It's me. It's my fault. This is what's keeping us here. So almost everyone else goes to the Telestial Kingdom, which is still 10 times better than Earth. I'm not sure, like, what metrics <laughs> we're using to calculate this. <laughs> Polling. Polling data. <laughs> the Starbucks lines are really quick. The same polls that find that, like, Finland is the happiest country every year, they also poll planets. <laughs> yeah. They're like, mm, how much better than Earth is it? It's like the Twitter poll where it's like five times, ten times, 
just want to see results. (laughs) (laughs) Only people who once knew the truth of the Mormon church, but then turned against it, go to that last place. Outer darkness. Oh, no. Which is so bad, no one can even describe it. But I think outer darkness is a pretty good description. It's like on the outside, it's really dark. Yeah. It's very evocative. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Outer darkness is good. Like, that should be the name of this Mm. game. It sounds like a, (laughs) yeah, outer darkness. Yeah. You have to get a family member back from outer darkness. We are creating a Mormon video game (laughs) as we speak. Like, this is going to be on sale on Steam in the next three years. And we're all going to get so many complaints. Okay, but I am going to make this. When I, when I get enough money, I am paying somebody to make this for me, which I call me making it. <laughs> um, also, there's people living on the moon and they're like really tall. God wants you to know that. Okay. that that's their thing. They're just really okay. tall. They just stand around all day just being tall. Because the, the gravity there. There's less gravity. There's less gravity. So they're like just stretching out. So they get out. really tall. <laughs> yeah. Uh, woo. So they just kind of float up as the ground. <laughs> like they have a little little balloon on top of their head. In the way that I was taller before I got degenerative disc disease and now I've shrunk. Like theirs is the opposite. Like yeah. their discs are so yeah. loose and like juicy that they're tall. Their discs are so generative. They're just yeah. like... <laughs> generating like fuck <laughs> just are generating like fucking crazy um also people live on the sun just so you know. god wants you to know that. cut to them on the side they're just screaming all the time because they're on fire <laughs> they're so tan <laughs> oh my god you guys are so tan they have to slather on the saint tropez <laughs> so the book of mormon claims uh that a group of jewish people like a family, Uh-oh. fled to America. <laughs> Don't we, like never, we never like when Christians are like, so nope. this group of Jewish people. And you're like, oh, my butthole's clenching. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, oh, no, that's a f- <laughs> red flag, red flag. <laughs> this is weird. But like, it's not the usual uh, mention of Jewish people in something like this. Um, but a family of Jewish people, or maybe just a couple, I'm not sure, like a like a couple that's together not like the number two a couple can be a family (laughs) okay (laughs) hashtag child free phase like whatever (laughs) um so this this couple of family uh fled to (laughs) what is now america and became the first people to live there what modern day people would see as the ancestors of all indigenous people Okay. So we have tests, which they know mm-hmm. about now because they do genealogy yeah. tests. <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot mm-hmm. in Mormon communities. And they still just sort of like, mm, we're going to pretend that this still makes sense. We also have archaeological mm-hmm. evidence that people came to the North American continent across the ice bridge <clears throat> from Asia. So cool, cool. Yeah. <laughs> also, Adam was God. Like this, like like the God. Yeah. Like God. Yeah. Not just like a God of his own planet. And kicked himself out, out of, of Eden. Out of Eden. <laughs> okay. Self-flagellation. He's like very masochistic. Yeah. And the descendants of Cain still live on Earth, cursed to have black skin. Okay. Oh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, and I'm familiar with, with some of the Mormon history with black people. Yeah. So black people are considered less valiant as in like in the war in heaven between Jesus and Satan, they were ambivalent, (laughs) which is the idea of just like them thinking that black people are evil because they saw like two, two brothers fighting and just like didn't get involved they were so black people are not allowed to hold the priesthood um no magical powers from god for you or get married in the temple which is a required for the celestial kingdom special treatment ultra heaven god status you can only have the second class heaven Mm, no earth for you 
or no planet. I love that we were started off being really worried this was going to be anti-Semitic and then it turned to be racist. Yeah, anti-black. Yeah. Like it was like we almost had relief and then it was like, oh, never mind. You know, you know, it's one of them. It's always yeah. at least one of always. them. Always, always. Usually both, yeah. honestly. Yeah. So Mormons believe that homosexuality makes a mockery of the procreative powers given to us by God, which is like hilarious. Mm, I love to mock the procreative powers given to us by God. <laughs> um, and is this wrong? It's wrong, but it's so right. <laughs> I mean... If it's wrong, why is it so delicious? <laughs> I love feeling so dirty. <laughs> Riddle me that. Um, and gay marriage is even worse because it's seen as Satan's cheap imitation. <laughs> I fucking love that. Ah, Satan's knockoff. <laughs> like, <laughs> Satan making a like. It's like a brand that you get at Hannaford or like a generic store brand. Yeah. <laughs> like my fucking proto purse. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that was put in writing, uh, specifically by Joseph and other people that claim to be Mormon prophets. And the thing about prophecies is if you're too specific, people know eventually that you were wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is 99% of prophecies. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, like <laughs> the Mormon prophets saying, you. Man would never reach the moon, not including the men that already live there. So that's a, it's a little embarrassing. Yeah. Mm. So the book's published. It's out. Less than two weeks later, on April 6th, 1830, Smith and his followers formally organized the Church of Christ. And small branches were established in Manchester, Fayette, and Colesville, New York. The Book of Mormon brought Smith regional notoriety and renewed the hostility of those who remembered the 1826 Chenango County trial where he was like a glass looker. And like, oh, okay, so now he's back and now he yes. is a prophet of God before he could find treasure by looking at stones in a hat. Yeah, this glass looking son of a bitch. I know. That's also a really dope phrase. Like being called like a glass looker. Like <laughs> glass looker. It's very Lana. Yeah. Well, yes, I do look in the glass a lot. <laughs> I guess now that you mention it, I do be looking in glass. <laughs> and it's called body dysmorphia <laughs> is a mental illness. Read a book. <laughs> after, and I have one, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it was sent to me by God. <laughs> After Cowdery baptized several new church members, Smith's followers were threatened with mob violence. Before Smith could confirm the newly baptized, he was arrested and charged with being a disorderly person. Although he was acquitted, both he and Cowdery fled to Colesville to escape a gathering mob. Smith would later claim that probably around this time, Peter, James, and John had appeared to him and had ordained him and Cowdery to a special higher priesthood. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god I love and also that he claimed it later it was like oh my god did i not tell you like three years ago uh i'm in the super secret special yeah. tier now <laughs> three of jesus's boyfriends came to me and made me extra special i'm actually priest plus <laughs> smith's authority was undermined when cowdry here in page this is my favorite thing and other church members also started being like i also just had a vision from god and he says i'm a prophet too <laughs> nah. oh my god it took them long enough I know. <laughs> day one i would have been like oh, i had the same vision but I thought it was just a dream. And he told me that I was his first choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He also, this isn't relevant, but he told me I was really pretty. Yeah. Like, yeah. he was like, just sidebar. I just have to say, because like, I can't stop thinking about it unless I say it. Yeah. You're so pretty. You're like way prettier in person. I know. I don't want to, I don't want to embarrass you, <laughs> but like everyone in heaven has been calling you angelic. We call you our little earth angel. <laughs> Okay, that's beside the point, but I just had to say something. I just had to say it. I just, wanted, it. To I just wanted to bring it up. <laughs> In response to his followers claiming that they themselves are also now prophets, Smith dictated a revelation which clarified his office as a prophet and an apostle, stating that only he had the ability to declare doctrine and scripture for the church. 
So oh, okay. he put a stop to that. Oh, of course. Smith <laughs> then dispatched Cowdery, Peter Whitmer, and others off. He was like, okay, now I have a special mission for you. Go to proselytize to Native Americans, which ugly. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cowdery was also assigned the task of locating the site of New Jerusalem, which was to be on the borders of the United States with what was then indigenous territory. On their way to Missouri, Cowdery's party passed through northeastern Ohio, where Sidney Rigdon and over a hundred followers of his variety of Campbellite restorationism converted to the Church of Christ, swelling the ranks of the new organization dramatically before they arrived. So they're like picking people up as they go. But only other weirdos. Right. Mm-hmm. Who are like, I also have like a weird, small, strange religion made up by a guy who's mad at me. <laughs> so after Rigdon visits New York, he soon becomes Smith's primary assistant. With growing opposition in New York, Smith announced a revelation that his followers should gather to Kirtland, Ohio, establish themselves as a people and await word from Cowdery's mission. So he's like, he's sending them around, but almost every time it's because people are starting to be like, what is this weird cultist doing? Mm, Like people do not like him, especially because everybody's Christian and he's coming and he's not only saying that he has a different belief than theirs, but like that theirs is completely fake. He's wrong. Yeah. And he talked to Jesus himself. Yeah. Like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like not just like I have a suspicion that what is going on is wrong yeah, or not just like we need to streamline the religion like some Martin Luther shit, like being like, I spoke to Jesus Christ himself ever heard of him. (laughs) And he said, you're full of shit. He says he doesn't know you. (laughs) I told him your name and he said, who? (laughs) He's a new phone When Smith moved to Kirtland in 1831, he encountered a religious culture that included enthusiastic demonstrations of spiritual gifts, including fits and trances, rolling on the ground, and speaking in tongue. Hell yeah. Yeah. The, like, good American, like, evangelistic Christianity. And he's like... Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. He just needs to be passing around go. some snakes. Yeah. Yeah. Check all those boxes. Yep. So to all of them, he seemed like chill. Like he was like subdued. Yeah. <laughs> like he seems dope. Yeah. Smith brought the Kirtland congregation under his authority and tamed most of the like ecstatic outbursts. But he promised church elders in Kirtland they would receive an endowment of heavenly power if they were to like follow his his teachings instead. Okay. So God has a sign on bonus. Yes. Absolutely. Um, When you will get it, nobody knows. Maybe it's after you're dead. Probably. So in June of 1831, he introduces at a conference, the higher power is going to be that you have a special priesthood. Not as special as his extra special priesthood, but a special one called high priesthood. So now there's like three different levels (laughs) of priests in the church. um, Mm -hmm. And you have to level up to get through them. It is a video game. I'm sorry. Like, it is a video game. So converts are pouring into Kirtland. By the summer of 1835, there were 1,500 to 2,000 Latter-day Saints in the vicinity, many expecting Smith to lead them very shortly to the new millennial kingdom. Though his mission to the indigenous people had been a failure, Cowdery and the other missionaries with him were charged with finding a site for a holy city. They found Jackson County, Missouri. After Smith visited in July 1831, he pronounced the frontier hamlet of independence the center place of Zion. So this is his New Jerusalem. This is God's God's land in America. Okay. In Missouri. <laughs> yes. God, God was like, you know what I love? Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> I like how that was the unbelievable part to you. I didn't even mean to make that a joke. I was just literally asking, like, wait, Missouri was what you said? Uh, Said said with the appropriate amount of disdain. In In Missouri. Missouri. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure Missouri is lovely for their... um, No, it isn't. You um, don't have to lie. I don't even know. (laughs) Trees? (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. For most of the 1830s, the church was based in Ohio, where Smith lived, though he visited Missouri again in early 1832 to prevent a rebellion of prominent church members who believed the church in Missouri was being neglected. So during this time, there's a lot of 
animosity and like bitterness coming from other churches because he's supposed to be like leading them and he's not there. So they're getting, they're like, why can't we come to where you are? And he's like, no, 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 no. Like, cause we need somebody there to recruit <laughs> more I people don't want to. <laughs> because I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> Turn around. So Smith's trip was hastened by a mob of Ohio residents who were incensed over the church's presence and Smith's political power, like growing in Ohio. The mob beat Smith and Rigdon unconscious, <gasps> tarred and feathered them, <gasps> and left them in the street Ooh. for dead. Oh, my God. They were not dead. Wow. I did, oh, my God. I, yeah, like full on. I don't want to sympathize for him, but like. Well, no, I think you can say being tarred and feathered sucks. isn't okay. No, nobody should be tarred and feathered. <laughs> like, actually, a uh, hot take, torture is wrong. Yeah. You want to kill a Mormon, right. kill a Mormon, it's, but you don't tar and feather them. We really shouldn't lynch people. <laughs> the, like the, the bashing, you know. Yeah, I'm going to take a political stance against lynching in this yeah. episode. Yeah, That's such a brave stance, Kaylin. Yeah. I wasn't going to use the word brave, so but brave. I respect that you did. In Jackson County, oh, okay. existing Missouri residents resented the Latter day Saint newcomers for both political and religious reasons. Um, and also, they were coming in 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 such numbers and recruiting so many people that they started to worry that elections were going to be swayed and they were going to control the county oh, yeah yeah right, right. so tensions increasing and in july 1833 non-mormons forcibly evict the mormons and destroy all their property like they they burn their houses and their churches everything these people I, yeah got such a huge persecution complex but like it's earned yeah <laughs> like, i was gonna say also hot take <laughs> you shouldn't run people out of their homes and set their churches on fire yeah i just that's like, also so brave <laughs> no matter how, how weird, weird they, they are, are. <laughs> no matter how much you might want to you still yes yeah uh, no matter how early they're ringing your doorbell first thing in the morning <laughs> the more you know star goes over both of your heads right now. no matter how nice they are no matter how little coffee they drink <laughs> you should not be setting their churches on fire. you two are heroes thank you yeah thank you <laughs> i didn't want to say courageous but <laughs> Cour someone has to is a good word courageous i just thought of that i don't know where it came from <laughs> Smith advised his followers to bear the violence patiently until after they had been attacked multiple times, after which they could fight back. He's not here for this, by the way. He's just like, just hold out. Just let, <laughs> let them do it a little more. Yeah. Just, just let them do it. It's fine. Armed bands exchanged fire, killing one Mormon and two non-Mormons until the old settlers forcibly expelled the Latter-day Saints from the county. In response, Smith led a small paramilitary expedition called Zion's Camp to aid the Latter-day Saints in Missouri. As a military endeavor, the expedition was a failure. The men of the expedition were disorganized, suffered from a cholera outbreak, and were severely <laughs> outnumbered. Smith sent two church representatives to petition Missouri Governor Daniel Dunklin for protection and support, but he was like, mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> you freaks <laughs> sorry what did you say about my I religion <laughs> yeah <laughs> by the end of june it had been de-escalated and the confrontation had was over and he was trying to seek peace with jackson county's residents and disbanded zion's camp so he's not like walking around like with a paramilitary group being like what we're we're just trying to find peace but mm -hmm. zion's camp still transformed the latter-day saint leadership because many future church leaders came from among the participants and like some had died and some were now like more radicalized. So it definitely, the paramilitary aspect like stuck around. Right. After the camp returned to Ohio, Smith drew heavily from its participants to establish various governing bodies. So he like made them like church leaders and said that he would give them an endowment. In 1835, he purchased a scroll of papyri containing egyptian hieroglyphics from a traveling showman named michael chandler was it real was he real <laughs> he then proceeded to examine the scroll claiming that it contained the writings of abraham and translated it to what is now known as the book of abraham in 1966 several fragments of the original scroll that smith used resurfaced and 
again, with the discovery of the Rosetta Stone. Egyptology had advanced profoundly by this time, and Egyptologists were able to validate whether Smith's translation of the scroll was accurate. In March 1836, at the temple's dedication, many who received the endowment reported seeing visions of angels and engaged in prophesying and speaking in tongues. So it sounds like it was a really cool party. Mm Mm-hmm. La 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 la. That's me speaking in tongues. That's, I think that's just you speaking with your tongue. Okay. I misunderstood. I I misunderstood the assignment. Let the tongues do all the talking, baby. In January 1837, Smith and other church leaders created a joint stock company called the Kirtland Safety Society to act as like a quasi bank. The company issued banknotes partly capitalized by real estate, and Smith encouraged his followers to buy the notes, in which he invested heavily himself. The bank failed within a month. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, that's been classic. As a result, Latter-day Saints in Kirtland suffered extreme high volatility and intense pressure from debt collectors. So they like moved into the Kirtland, started a bank, failed in a month. And now when they walk down the street, people are like, where's my fucking money, you freak? (laughs) Which fair, where is my fucking money, Mm -hmm. you freak? And he pulls like a George Bailey from It's a Wonderful Life. And he's like, it's in Jeremiah's house and James's (laughs) house and Jeremy's house. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Jeremy and Jeremiah next to each other. they all have J names because I just assume that all Mormons of course. have J names Josiah yeah. <laughs> yeah. Smith was held responsible for the failure and there were widespread defections from the church including many of his closest advisors oh, no. the failure of the bank was but one of a part of series of internal disputes uh, content warning this is where there's just a mention of a inappropriate relationship if you don't want to hear about that because going forward in this we will talk about that uh, multiple times Uh, but cowdery had accused smith of engaging in a sexual relationship with a teenage servant in his home fanny alger who was 14 and this is something that goes on for a very long time because he is uh polygamously marrying random young women so was the other Mm -hmm. guy's complaint that she was 14 or was it that he was having like extramarital 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 yeah that's what i thought i was gonna say it's very progressive for them to care (laughs) like yeah they're like teenagers those are for fun no he's like Like, those other marriages aren't considered as valid if you don't believe in polygamy Uh, well also like according to god as far as anyone knew at this point that was adultery and that was yeah yeah was exactly but yeah conveniently god. joseph was like no god actually said i can have multiple yes. wives and some of them can be 14 yes and some of them can mm-hmm. be 50 he went back and forth mm-hmm. he had oh, okay he had so a lot of wives he wasn't just an a phoebophiliac no. in 1838 he had abandoned plans to redeem zion and jackson county because he had like <laughs> fucked up too many times it was like okay <laughs> so now a town in the far west of missouri called caldwell county is the new zion um so i guess god mm-hmm. just okay. moves the chosen land based on mm-hmm. how many pit people <laughs> that he pisses off yeah like, okay, don't start a bank in this next one because I can't move Zion again. Yeah. <laughs> in Missouri, the church also took the name Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. Um, basically, what they're saying is they're in the end of days before Jesus returned. So they are the Latter-day Saints, the people in the church. Um, and construction begins on a new temple. In the weeks and months after Smith and Rigdon arrived at Far West, Thousands of Latter-day Saints followed them from Kirtland, and Smith encouraged the settlement of land outside Caldwell County, instituting a settlement in adam Andy Amon in Davies County. I'm pretty sure this is on, um, I mean, everything in America is, but I'm pretty sure this is like very specifically on Indigenous territory. Mm-hmm. Uh, political and religious differences between old Missourians and the newly arriving cults provoked tensions between the two groups much as they had in Jackson County. And by this time, Smith's experiences with mob violence led him to believe that his faith survival required greater militancy against anti-Mormons, is what he called them. Which, like, kind of fair, because they did chase them out and burn their house down. But like, And burn their 
churches yeah. down yeah. and tarred yeah. and feathered yeah. a couple of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A handful. <laughs> Tensions between the Mormons and the native Missourians escalated quickly until on August 6, 1838, non-Mormons in Gallatin, Missouri, tried to prevent Mormons from voting. The Election Day scuffles initiated the 1838 Mormon War. When I found this in my research, I'm like, they've been doing a lot. Like, <laughs> they've been around for like <laughs> less than 20 years and they already have a war. Like, it's been busy. Yeah. It's been a busy couple of years. Hectic. All the other religions are, you know, way ahead of them in terms of stuff like that. So they had to catch up. They were oh, like, yeah, fair. studying really fast. You know, that makes Man. sense. Really been. Like Joseph has been on his calendar blocking game, like his oh, cal- blocking. He's like, oh yeah, he's on top of it, filling his days. He's like, we got to get some stuff accomplished. Yeah, we need yeah. to start a little war. Mm-hmm. It's giving because he's so busy that like the Reba theme song. It's like a single mom who works two jobs and loves her kids mm-hmm. and never stops. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. With a heart of a fighter, yeah. I'm a survivor. Like mm-hmm. he's doing really good. <laughs> Him and his little mom jeans. Having <laughs> mine is having to move every like month, and that little bitty bank failure. Mm-hmm. So, eighteen thirty-eight, non-Mormon vigilantes raided and burned Mormon farms, while day nights and other Mormons pillaged non-Mormon town. So, like everybody's going bonkers, everybody's burning yeah. and pillaging and stealing. It is giving crusades. Yeah, like. Credit where credit is a due. Yeah. yeah. In the Battle of Crooked River, a group of Mormons attacked the Missouri State Militia, mistakenly believing them to be anti-Mormon vigilantes. Which is like, <laughs> my bad. And I oops. <laughs> oopsie. So Governor Lilburn Boggs, which is an amazing name. <laughs> Lilburn. Lilburn, L-I-L-B-U-R-N. Oh, that sounds like a little rapper. Yeah. Is he a SoundCloud rapper? <laughs> Burn. Governor Lilburn Boggs ordered that the Mormons be exterminated or driven from the state. On October 30th, a party of Missouri surprised and killed 17 Mormons in the Hans Mill Massacre. The following day, the Mormons surrendered to 2,500 state troops and agreed to forfeit their property and leave the state again. Smith was immediately brought before a military court, accused of treason, and then sentenced to be executed the next morning. But Alexander Donovan, who was Smith's former attorney and a brigadier general in the Missouri militia, refused to carry out the order. So Smith was sent to a state court for a preliminary hearing where several of his former allies testified against him. Smith and five others, including Rigdon, were charged with treason and transferred to the jail at Liberty, Missouri to await the trial. Smith bore his imprisonment stoically, according to reports, understanding that he was effectively on trial before his own people, many of whom considered him a fallen prophet. So he wrote a personal defense and an apology for the activities of his followers. He basically, it wasn't my fault. It was... Classic apology yeah. video shenanigans. Absolutely. I'm sorry you think mm-hmm. I did something wrong. <laughs> did I lead you all into a massacre? Yes. 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 Did I know that those were state troopers? No. Is it my fault? No. No. <laughs> Am, Am I, I sorry? sorry? No, because that would be a lie <laughs> because I didn't do it. And God doesn't want me to lie to you. He sent me here to tell you the truth. And the truth is you're being a little bit of a stinky bitch right now in the way that you're acting. <laughs> <laughs> the keys of the kingdom, he wrote, have not been taken away from us. Though he directed his followers to collect and publish their stories of persecution to get people to feel bad for them, he also urged them to moderate their antagonism towards non-Mormons. So basically, we don't have the numbers to be doing this. So like, (laughs) we need to be oppressed and we need to be uh, like not so retaliatory and aggressive. Like stop like- That each other. It's very strategic. Stop Mm -hmm. spitting on people on the street and telling them they're going to hell. (laughs) For now. Right. Yeah. Until until we get this handled. On April 6th, 1839, after a grand jury hearing in Davies County, Smith and his companions escaped custody, almost certainly with the help of the sheriff and the guards. Many American newspapers criticized Missouri for the Hans Mill Massacre and the state's expulsion of the Mormons. Illinois then accepted Mormon refugees who gathered along the banks of the Mississippi River. And the fact that they were like refugees from inside America going to 
right. like crossing a little river and going into another state. Like I always forget how like individual the states are there until I read something like this. And I'm like, you are a refugee from your country mm-hmm. in your own country. Mm-hmm. Once in mm-hmm. Illinois, Smith purchased a high priced swampy woodland in the hamlet of commerce, which is like, I don't know, this is kind of beautiful. This is giving Shakespeare. Like, I'm sorry, you're moving to somewhere named Commerce. That's gorgeous. Isn't that just selling things? <laughs> the town of selling things? <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. I mean, my family just packed up and moved to capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> my name's Economy. Hello. <laughs> Ooh. It's a beautiful name for a girl. Economy Smith. <laughs> he attempted to portray the Mormons as an oppressed minority and unsuccessfully petitioned the federal government to help in obtaining reparations. <laughs> During the summer of 1839, while Mormons in Illinois suffered from a malaria epidemic, Smith sent Young and other apostles apostles to missions in Europe, where they made numerous converts, many of them poor factory workers. But at this time, he's also attracting like some wealthy and influential converts, um, like people in the military and people in the government, because like, I don't know, the promise of getting to be a god on your own planet is like pretty enticing. Mm -hmm. Like I would want to do that. And if you if you see somebody coming in and they have that many followers, and he says that they read the tablets, like, I don't know, maybe it would be a little more convincing than like a guy with like his four friends or whatever. Mm -hmm. So he basically starts his own city and gets, uh, gets people that work in the state legislature to agree to this. So it's a, he's now in charge of a city called Nauvoo, Nauvoo, Nauvoo. Sorry. Navu. Navu. N A U V O O. I remembered I Googled it. It's Navu. Um, it's cute, right? It's like the Navi from Avatar. Yeah, that's the first thing I thought of. <laughs> I actually just thought of uh, Nabu oh. from the Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, wait, shit, that's where Queen Amidala is. <laughs> the charter granted the city virtual autonomy authorized a university and granted Nauvoo habeas corpus power, which allowed Smith to fend off extradition to Missouri. So now he's like running his own little city and the Latter-day Saints control the government, but the city guaranteed religious freedom for its residents. So I'm like, it's a little based. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have to be a Mormon to live here. Sure. We'll all tell you'll go to hell yeah, and you'll probably be like socially pressured at every single moment to convert. But Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And then they also started a militia. Classic. So they have a city. They have a militia. Classic Christian cult stuff. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. What do we need other than God? Guns. Mm, Guns. God, guns, and girls. The three Gs of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Is it a coincidence that God and gun have the same number of letters? I think not. It's obviously not. not. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in coincidences. The early Nauvoo years were a period of doctoral innovation. Smith introduced baptism for the dead in 1840. And 1841, (laughs) construction began on the temple as a place for recovering lost ancient knowledge. Which is very funny to me that you would build something new to find lost ancient knowledge. Because, like, you're just going to go in and, like, shove your face in a hat for, like, half an hour. <laughs> a hat with two stones. I also love baptizing the dead. I feel like. Is that a, it sounds like our sequel. Baptize the dead. <laughs> Welcome to Baptize the Dead, the podcast where we do. But yeah. we do. So, in 1842, Smith became a Freemason. And then in May of 1842, he introduced what is now known as the Temple Endowment Session. The Temple Endowment Session is among the most secretive rituals in the Mormon church. Unlike other rituals, such as the baptism or administration of the sacrament, members are not allowed to discuss the endowment session in public. During an actual session, members perform rituals involving secret handshakes and passwords I love that. <laughs> All necessary. We got a little secret handshake that's so cute. I know. I <laughs> love it. So cute. All necessary to be allowed entry into the celestial kingdom where God the Father and the Son live. What they don't know is that these rituals were almost word for word stolen from Freemasonry. <laughs> he like he joined them, took their rituals, and then peaced out. Like, oh, these are some good ideas. Yeah. He plagiarized them. This happened to my friends. Bring it on. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 
He took his little video camera and filmed <laughs> their stuff. <laughs> at the ad- oh, at the endowment is where you get your magic underwear. We ha- we haven't really talked about them okay. that much, but the magic underwear. That's where you get your magic underwear, which according to the church, the temple garments serve a number of purposes. First, it provides the member a constant reminder of the covenants they made in the temple. <laughs> Second, when the garment is properly worn, it provides protection against temptation and evil. Um, Also, sometimes um, it can make you like super strong and have magic powers. Not always, but like just sometimes. But sometimes. It can like fend off evil influences and strengthens you to resist temptation. Um, Because they're ugly. Yes. It's a lot. I mean, I'm kind of into it, but. I'm picturing like a super muscly guy and like, I'm sorry, you can put anything on like some ripped dude and it's going to look good. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, that's just how that works. Mm -hmm. Uh, The nature of the protection believed to be afforded by the temple garments is ambiguous and varies between people. Researchers who interviewed a sample of Latter-day Saints who wear the temple garment reported that virtually all wearers expressed a belief that wearing the garment provided spiritual protection and encouraged them to keep their covenants. Some of those interviewed asserted that the garment also provided physical protection. So like might stop a bullet (laughs) while others seemed less certain. (laughs) Let's test that. Yeah. (laughs) In Mormon folklore, tales are told of Latter-day Saints who credit their temple garments with helping them survive car wrecks, fires, (laughs) and natural disasters. And I'm like, that is not. It's not a force field. (laughs) (laughs) Like, uh, like you get like hit by a tornado, but like you're standing there and you're like underwear. (laughs) It's like, yeah, it's, it's not even flapping in the wind. (laughs) No, I only ran out of this burning building because I remembered to wear my lucky underwear. (laughs) If I hadn't done that, I would have just stood there. Like, what do do I I do? do? See, what you do is you do a special uh, uh, combo attack where you, you hit down and B at the same time. You you charge that up, and then when you let it go, that's how, what causes the defensive shield to oh, protect right, you. Right, right. Yeah. Of course. Because they're yeah, video yeah. game underwear. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like a quick time event, but a little bit more complicated. Yeah. At, right. at first, the endowment was only for men, but um, eventually... Uh, Smith introduced for women the Relief Society. Oh, for her. A service club <laughs> and sorority. I wish it was pink. pink. (laughs) It's not pink. So in summer of 1842, he's like, okay, we're not really doing the whole like Zion thing as like a a refuge from impending tribulation. We're just going to like make like a cute little city. Because I think you realize that you have like a lot more power like running your own city than you do moving place to place with a bunch of people and getting kicked out every time you go somewhere. Yeah. Um, And now that it's his city, he also has his own laws. And this is where he starts really pushing and marrying secretly a bunch of additional wives in what he called plural marriage. Mm. By some accounts, he had been teaching a polygamy doctrine as early as 1831. And there is evidence that he may have been a polygamist by 1835, although the church has been like, "Mm, absolutely not. But remember, Cowdery suspected Smith was in a relationship with Fanny, the Mm 14-year-old. He didn't deny it, but he was like, ah, 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 but I never committed adultery. I have been accused of this, and I have never committed adultery. Yeah. But historians say that was him being like, because I married her. Mm Mm-hmm. Right, because she is my wife, it's no longer considered yeah. adultery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In April 1841, Smith secretly wed Louisa Beeman, and during the next two and a half years, he secretly married or was sealed to about 30 or 40 additional women. Jesus Christ, how do you have the time? Yeah. Um, 10 of his wives were between the ages of 14 and 20. Mm-hmm. Others were over 50. 10 were already married to other men. Um, and only some of those, the husbands, were like, chill with it. Um, polygamy caused a breach between Smith and his first wife, Emma. And historian Laurel Thatcher summarized by stating that Emma vacillated in her support for plural marriage, sometimes acquiescing to Joseph Sealings, sometimes resisting. I don't love the phrase sometimes resisting because it does not sound like she was happy to be with him and that yeah. she had a choice. If she sometimes resisted, that probably means she resisted yes 
<laughs> like, yeah. and acquiesce is not in, is not consent. Yeah, it's not enthusiastically yeah. consent. So Smith introduced the polygamous doctrine to a few of his closest associates, including Bennett, who used it as an excuse to seduce numerous women, wed and unwed, young and old. When rumors of polygamy called spiritual whiffery by Bennett, which I love. <laughs> whiffery. Smith forced Bennett's resignation as Navo mayor. In retaliation, Bennett left and began publishing sensational accusations against Smith and his followers. By mid-1842, popular opinion in Illinois had turned against the Mormons after an unknown assailant shot and wounded Missouri Governor Lilburn Boggs. Lilburn! Lilburn! Lilburn, Lilburn no! Oh, no. Yeah. And everyone was like, the Mormons did it. Um, R.I.P. No. Lilburn. I don't think that they did, but there's no evidence to say that they did. So while this ended the Missourians' attempt at extradition, it caused significant political follow in Illinois, and Smith petitioned Congress to make Nauvoo an independent territory with the right to call out federal troops in its defense. Smith then wrote to leading presidential candidates asking, like, what are you going to do to protect the Mormons? And everyone was like, mm, we support you, like, I guess, protecting yourself or, like, burn in hell. So he announced his independent candidacy for president of the United States. Okay. Yeah. Suspended regular proselytizing and sent out the Quorum of the Twelve and hundreds of other political missionaries. Quorum. The, I love word. the word quorum. Quorum. Mm. Yeah. Quorum is a fun word. And I love quorum of the Twelve. Like, this is so, this sounds dope as fuck. Quorum mm. of the Twelve. Yeah. Mm. It's very metal. It is. In March 1844, following a dispute with a federal bureaucrat, he organized the secret Council of 50, which was given the authority to decide which national or state laws Mormons should obey, as well as establish its own government for Mormons. So, like, at this point, he's he's doing the, like, Queen of Canada thing, where he's like, these are the laws you don't have to obey. Uh, I'm running for president, so, like, I'll pardon you when I win. It's, like, very Trump as well. <laughs> By early 1844, a rift had developed between Smith and half a dozen of his closest associates. People are getting a little mad because he keeps proposing to their wife. <laughs> 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 Which, like, guys oh, tend no. to not love. <laughs> you do, can you not? The audacity. I love I that. I know. <laughs> he just can't stop proposing. I just imagine he's doing it like right in front of the husbands and they're just like, hey. <laughs> he just can't stop proposing. He just he just loves a proposal. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. He loves a dramatic proposal. Yeah. He's like in a hot air balloon. So believing these men were plotting against his life. Uh, so he says <laughs> he excommunicates them, leaving their wives in his care, I guess. Law and Foster subsequently formed a competing reform church. And on June 7th, the dissidents published the first and only issue of the Nauvoo Expositor, calling for reform within the church, but also appealing politically to non-Mormons. The paper alluded to Smith's theocratic aspirations, called for a repeal of the Nauvoo City Charter, and decried his new doctrines of many gods. It also attacked Smith's practice of polygamy, implying that he was using religion as a pretext to draw unassuming window to Nauvoo to seduce and marry them. Fearing the expositor would provoke a new round of violence against the Mormons, the Nauvoo City Council declared the newspaper a public nuisance and ordered the Nauvoo Legion to destroy its printing press. During the council debate, Smith vigorously urged the council to order the press destroyed, not realizing that destroying a newspaper was more likely to incite an attack than any of the newspaper's accusations. So he burned it down. So he he, he burned it down. The printing press. Oh. <laughs> well, I guess that's one way to solve your problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you! <laughs> <laughs> and then was like, oh, my God, I'm being attacked by an angry mob. What are you doing? This is insane. And declares martial law. People do not love this. You don't say. Just saying. Uh, and riots start. City councils being attacked. On June 25th, Smith and his brother arrive in Carthage to stand trial for inciting a riot. Once the Smiths were in custody, the charges were increased to treason, preventing them from posting bail. 
On June 27th, 1844, an armed mob with blackened faces stormed Carthage jail. So they like- Problematic. Can I just say problematic? Problematic. Like- Absolutely. Yes, 100%. So they stormed the jail where Joseph and Hiram were being detained. Hiram, who's trying to secure the door, was killed instantly with a shot to the face. Wow. <gasps> I guess his magic underwear did not protect. Oh, because he wasn't wearing them on his face. It did not help. He should, uh, yeah. should have worn it on yes. his face. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Smith fired three shots from a pepper box pistol. <laughs> that is cute. Pepper that box. sounds so cute. That sounds like a special gun you'd get in a video game. <laughs> pepper box pistol <laughs> that his friend Cyrus H. Wheelock had lent him. Yeah. I know. The pepper box pistol that you get from Cyrus H. Wheelock is like that's like that's like a level <laughs> a... one pistol though. Yeah. Like you get much Yo, he was using his level one. But you one can't pistol. upgrade it though. Yeah. You can't yes. upgrade it. There's a lot of cool things you can add as you uh, level up your character. Yes. But this is why he's not he's not doing so hot. <laughs> yeah. Because he's no. using his level one pistol. His level one gun. Yeah. So yeah. he manages to wound and kill some people. Um, but he realizes that he's not going to make it. So he removes his magic underwear, makes a Masonic <laughs> symbol in the air me. for distress and springs for the window. <laughs> Uh, he goes for a Batman <laughs> and jumps out the window. <sighs> um, he was shot multiple times before oh. even making it out the window, oh, crying, fuck. oh, Lord, my God. Oh, just... <laughs> he died shortly after hitting the ground, but was shot several more times <laughs> yeah. by an improvised firing squad before the mob dispersed. <laughs> Oh, wow. oh Lord, my God. <laughs> and then they just like ran him over a couple of times with a car, like ran him over and then reversed it and went back. Oh my over. God. It's my favorite that he's like. <laughs> Like, I imagine him jumping out of that window with, like, bullets piercing his flesh. And he, like, pauses in the air and, like, holds up a Wiley Coyote sign that's like, oh, what, what? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord, oh, my God. God. <laughs> Pew. He blinks twice. And then I, I love that he did, like, a Masonic <laughs> yeah. symbol first because he wanted to cover all his bases. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just in case. He just goes through a bunch of them. It's like that scene in The Mummy 1989. Yeah. <laughs> Never seen it. You said fucking what? <laughs> I'm just doing that to fuck with you. <laughs> like, that was a targeted attack at you. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I'm outside your house. <laughs> Following Smith's death, non-Mormon newspapers were nearly unanimous in portraying him as a religious fanatic. But in the Latter Day Saint community, he was a prophet and now a, a martyr. martyr. Yeah, 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 yeah. After a public funeral and viewing of the deceased brothers, Smith's widow, who feared hostile non-Mormons might try to desecrate the bodies, had their remains- I bet his body looked like shit. Oh my God, yeah. There there was no- (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He looked like ground beef. His widow, who feared hostile non-Mormons might try to desecrate the bodies, had the remains buried at night in a secret location with substitute coffins filled with sandbags interred in the publicly attested grave. Modern biographers and scholars, Mormon and non-Mormon alike, agree that Smith was one of the most influential, charismatic, and innovative figures in American religious history. (laughs) He did innovate. I do not agree, (laughs) but nobody asked me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> in popular opinion, however, non-Mormons in the U.S. generally consider Smith a charlatan, scoundrel, and heretic. While outside the U.S., he is mostly obscure. He's a scam god. <laughs> scam goddess. He's living on his scam planet right now. Yeah. As a god. <laughs> Running like little fake GoFundMes on Twitter from his from his <laughs> private planet. Actually, his ghost has been guiding the NFT market this whole time. Oh, R.I.P. Joseph Smith. You would have loved NFTs. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Respect the Dead. You can follow Respect the Dead on Instagram and Twitter at underscore Respect the Dead. If you want to follow us individually, you can find our socials in the show notes. And you should check out our YouTube channels. We don't shit on dead people there as often, but still, we're making tons of cool stuff. If you enjoyed Respect the Dead and would like to support us, there's a couple of ways to do that. You can give us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you found us. If you leave us a review, we can read it out on the podcast. Reviews are the best way for new listeners to discover the show. Give us at least five stars and then share us with a good friend who likes venting about dead people. 
You can also give us some money over on our Patreon. Patreon supporters get some cool bonus content like bloopers from the cutting room floor and even coming up with a fake sponsor ad that we'll read in an episode. It has to be a fake business though, not your MLM, honey. Thanks so much for listening. Join us every Monday for our next Worm Feast. I'm Kellen Conrad. I'm Ailey Mandy. And I'm Hoots. Bye. 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 Bye.